man, you know, that's, that's the heart of our church. That's the heart. We want to fill heaven from Knoxville, baby. We want to see people go from dead to alive. We don't, wanna, we don't necessarily want to see people go from good people to better people. Man, we want to see dead to alive. Can I get an amen on that? Man, so good, so good. Now, um, like I said earlier, my name is Austin, and uh, um, I have a problem. <laughs> when I get in my car, <laughs> they're laughing like, he's got a lot of problems. Okay. <laughs> When I get in my car, I imagine my car, my 1997 Jeep Cherokee Sport, four-wheel drive, 313,000 miles on it, had it since I was 15. Won't he do it? Okay, it's good. All right. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. That's not in my notes. Anyway, my car, I have a problem. When I get in my car, I imagine my car to be a safe zone. I don't know if you do this or not. But when I get in my car, I imagine that no one else around me, when I'm in my car, can see what I'm doing in my car. Does anybody else get that vibe? Okay. Get in your car, and it's like, I can do whatever I want. Now, just to give you a little bit more information about my car, my car has 0% tinted windows. (laughs) So literally, I am driving around in a big old glass box. But, but there's something funny about, like, people in general, like, when we get in our cars, it's like it's a safe space. It's a safe zone. There are things <laughs> that you have done in your car that you would never do in line at Kroger. Now, some of y'all are taking it to a place I'm not trying to go. I'm talking about picking your nose, okay? But in my car, I get in my car, I feel safe in my car. Like, I can sing at the top of my lungs, and I'm the worst singer in the world. I can sing as loud as I want. Like, I, I can let it go with the best of them. Like, me and Elsa, we be letting it go all the time, and it's great. I can, I can quite, to be honest with you, I got my car, <laughs> a few months ago, I got my car, my Jeep, detailed for the first time ever. And, um, and I stopped... <laughs> This isn't in my notes either, babe. I'm sorry. Uh, And I stopped picking my nose and flicking it in the seat because I got my car detailed. So then I started throwing it out the window. All right, you know you pick your nose. Don't be, you're not better than me, okay? Um, (laughs) But there's some stuff you will do in your car you will not do in line. Like maybe in line at Walmart, but like not at Target. You know what I'm saying? And my, my Jeep is like that. I'll sing at the top of my lungs. I will... (laughs) <laughs> I will, you know, scratch my brain. I'll do all kinds of stuff. You will probably, you know, do the same exact kind of stuff. Like one time, I, I actually got a pizza, and and I ate my pizza as I was driving, like a large pizza just sitting over there. I don't know if you've ever done that. Like that is a different type of life you've got to live, okay? And uh, it's great. It's great. Like there's things in your car that you will do that you will not do anywhere else until... <laughs> until you get caught red-handed. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I love driving up next to people. And they are doing something. They think that they are in a safe zone. They think they are in a safe place. They are screaming at their kids. They are cussing their kids on the way to church. Some of y'all today. <laughs> and, and then they are picking their nose. And then, you know, they're just doing all the things. And I love pulling up next to them and just looking and just waiting on that awkward eye contact. And then they look over and it's like, yup, got them. (laughs) Every time, every time. But for some reason, for some reason, when, when I get in my car, I think it's a safe space. And it's really just a glass box. You know what I think about the church a lot of times? I love my church, by the way. I love this place. But what, what I think about the church a lot of times is that we roll in and we roll in with concepts and mis- misconceived notions about what the church is and what people are like. And if I go in and, and I can't really be myself because it is a glass box. I can't really come in and be myself because other people are going to judge me. I can't really come in and be myself because other people are going to look down on me. And I want to let you know today in this series, I Love My Church, that Heart and Soul Church is not for you to come and put a mask on. I'm not talking about a mask in N95. I'm talking about, like, let me put on my mask that I'm a good person today. Let me put on my mask that I'm a perfect Christian today. Heart and Soul Church, one of the reasons I love my church is because you can come here imperfect, messed up, don't got it all together and you know what you're going to find not judgment but people that love you that you can come here with all of your flaws with all of your dysfunction 
with all of your delusion, with all of your drug addiction, with all of your alcoholism, with all of your stuff that you did last night, you can show up at heart and soul the next day. I believe that the church should be a place that is a safe space for people to come to hear about Jesus. I think people ought to be able to roll up in here and not have anything come between them and Jesus. One of our main focuses as Heart and Soul Church from 6.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. is to come here and to set this space up and to serve people in order to break down barriers so people have no reason not to look at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. We're not parking cars because we want to be better than Disney. We're not trying to, you know, wave and smile because we want to be up there with Chick-fil-A. No, we're trying to break down barriers. And I love my church because we break down barriers so people can come to Jesus. I love my church. I love my church. I love this place. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I, I'm a pastor's kid, so I've been in church my whole life. Like, the, 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 next, the next Sunday after my mom gave birth to me, guess where I was? In the nursery. Your boy was grown up, raised in church, okay? I've been in every kind of church you could imagine. I've been in the ones where they run up and down the aisles. I've been in the ones where they, they throw the flags, where they pass you out and put a cover over you. I've been in the ones where, you know, you sit on your hands and you don't move. You know what I'm saying? You tap your toe and it's like, man, he's, he's getting the spirit. Like, I've been in all kinds of different churches I've been in all kinds of different churches and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that if your boy wasn't the pastor here he would still attend here because I love my church I love this church I love this church and my desire is that this would be a safe place where anybody and everybody can come as they are that you don't have to check your stuff at the door to get in (laughs) <laughs> that you don't, have to, you don't have to get better before you can come in. One of the verses I say almost every single Sunday is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Not when you got fixed up, not when you got better, but while you were still a sinner. And what I believe about the church, what I believe about heart and soul, what I believe about the church in general, I believe that we ought to be a place where you can roll up and you can be told what you can be, not in and of yourself, but because of Jesus Christ. I believe that the world has it going on with telling you what you're not. I believe you can go to work and get get told what you're not, that you can go to your family and get told what you're not. You can go to school and get told what you can't do, what you shouldn't do, what you wouldn't be one day. But I believe you ought to come to church, and we ought to be able to be a place that tells you and shows you what you can be, not in and of yourself, but through Jesus Christ. The, the world will tell you enough times and enough ways and enough places of how you can't be something. I want to be a place, I want this to be a place where you can roll up and hear what God can do in your life. And I wonder, man, to be honest, I wonder how many people in Knoxville, Tennessee have a desire to find a place, and maybe they don't say church, but find a place or to find some people or to find a purpose bigger than them. How many people do you know that don't really have a purpose? They're just going to job, their job Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and then living for the weekend. And how many people do you know that don't really have people in their life to encourage them and lift them up? How many people do you know that don't have a safe place to be themselves, that they're always having to be Instagram Austin, or they're always having to be TikTok Austin or they're always having to be you know school Austin and they have different places and different things how many people do you know in Knoxville that don't have those things I want this place to be a place where people can come and hear about Jesus where they can find those things where, where they can hear what God can do in their life and many people don't ever darken the the, the doors of a church because they have an expectation of what it's going to be. They think it's like a glass car that you can see in and everyone's going to look in and instead of accepting them and bringing them along to see what God can do through them, what they, what they believe many times is that they're going to judge me where I am. And for Heart and Soul Church, that, that's not the way. See, when we come together here at Heart and Soul, we come together and we are unified under one big story. (laughs) 
We say it here all the time this way. We're filling heaven from Knoxville. We're filling heaven from Knoxville. If you're a first-time guest like, and you don't like hearing we're filling heaven, this is not the church for you because every Sunday we talk about filling heaven from Knoxville and we're going to beat that dead horse until it's dead again, until Jesus raises it and we kill it again. Like We're filling heaven from Knoxville. We're filling heaven from Knoxville. But listen to me, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. We believe, we believe here at Heart and Soul, that God loves the world. That he loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus. And Jesus, born of a virgin Mary, lived on the earth 30 perfect years before he ever did a miracle, before he ever did anything. And then for three years he was in ministry and he was performing miracles and he was talking, telling the Pharisees, you know, you're the worst and like fixing stuff. And then on his, when he was 33, he died on a cross and they put him into a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he kicked hell, death in the grave right in the teeth and walked out of the tomb. And then Jesus, he ascended into heaven. Get this, he ascended into heaven. And now he is alive and well, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ready one day to return for his people. We are united around Jesus. I love my church because we are united around Jesus. You know what? We're not, <laughs> we're not united or divided based on whether you voted for a Republican or a Democrat. We're united over Jesus. We're not united or divided based on whether you want to wear a mask or you don't want to wear a mask. We're united over Jesus. We're not united over whether you want to get the vaccine or you don't want to get the vaccine. We're united under Jesus. We're not united or divided based on race or skin color. We are united under the banner of Jesus. We are not united or divided based on the economy or your socioeconomic status, whether you come in looking like a model from H&M or you got everything from Walmart. We don't care. We are united under Jesus. We are not united or divided based on anything else. The only two things that we are united under is Jesus. And the Vols are the best football team in the nation. And if you, and if you love Alabama, today's the day you get right with the Lord and you give your life to Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we are united under Jesus. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. But listen, here's a question. What makes us us because every church wants to be united under Jesus or it should now whether that actually happens is another debate entirely but what makes us us and 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 this whole series is about this I love my church and honestly a lot of it is because of our core values our core values that's what makes us us like I said already, that if I didn't go to this church, or if I wasn't the pastor of this church, I would still go to this church. And a lot of it has to do with the core values of our church. The four big statements we say all the time. And if you, you haven't gone all in and joined a team or a party, you may not know these or be familiar with these. I want to encourage you today. Like, it's time to get on the team, get in the army, and we're, we're going to go after hell, and we're going to go charge hell with some squirt guns, and we're going to go see Jesus change some lives. I love my church because we call the champion out of people. I love my church because we call the champion out of people. That's one of our core values. One of our four is we call the champion out of people. We call the champion out of people. And it brings me back to one of my favorite Proverbs where we get the call the champion out of people. And it's Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 25. Proverbs 11 25 says this the generous will prosper those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed 
A lot of times we, we think that we're going to get refreshment. We think that we're going to get encouragement. We think we're going to get better by other people always giving something to us where Scripture says that if you'll just start backing away from yourself and start refreshing somebody else, encouraging somebody else, challenging somebody else, adding value to somebody else, you know what will happen? It will come right back to you. That is the law of the harvest. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I love my church because we call the champion out of people. And you know what the key word is right there? Calling the champion out of people? The key word, honestly, is people. <laughs> it's all about people. It's all about people. You're a people. I'm a people. We're all people. And that little thing about churches and steeples and peoples, I don't know how they do it with the fingers, but we're all people. We're just a bunch of people, man. We're just a bunch of imperfect people. We're just a bunch of messed up people. I, I'm not here to stand on stage just because I got a Britney Spears mic on my face. Does not mean I'm any better than you. It just means I'm an imperfect person that God called to be on stage. All of us are imperfect people. That's why we need Jesus. The key word, though, is people. And really, like, isn't that what Jesus was all about? <laughs> Jesus is all about people. All about people. Jesus rolls onto the scene, and when, when the Pharisees tried to trap him in the law, or they tried to trap him with weird questions, you know what Jesus always did? Jesus always turned it back around to people. Loving people. Loving people. Loving God and loving people. It's all about people. It's why here at Heart and Soul, and why even in the life of Jesus, we prioritize people. Prioritize people. Jesus, get this, I don't know if you remember this or not, but Jesus died for people. Jesus didn't die for a spectacle. Jesus didn't die to be written about in a book. Jesus didn't die to, Jesus died for people. Jesus died for people, and we are called to love people. That's why one of the things that I say often is, man, we choose people over policy. People over policy. If policy interrupts people, you choose people. We, we choose here at Heart and Soul, we choose people over politics. If politics alienate people, you know what we do? We back up and we choose people. People, 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 people over positions. This is a big one. If your position of authority or leadership or, you know, this goes, this isn't just about church, guys. This is about your life. If you will call the champion out of people where you live, work, play, eat, wherever you go, I promise your influence will spread. And wherever you have a position, listen, if you will choose people over the position, you will get a better position. We choose people over position. We choose people over preference. <laughs> if your preference keep you from reaching people, we always go with people. That's why one day the songs that we just sang up here, the songs that, that were just amazing, and that third song was one that was original and written by the Heart and Soul Collective, which is awesome. But one day the songs that we just sang up there will no longer be relevant. And just because they're from the good old days doesn't mean we will stay with those. We will continue to change and grow and adapt to reach the next generation. We choose people over preference. We choose people over preference. We call the champion out of people because it's all about people. But then there's a simple question that has to be asked is, okay, well then how do you call the champion out of people? Because it sounds cute, it sounds sticky, but how do you call the champion out of people? Did you know that... Um, too much of a good thing can be bad. Did you know that? <laughs> For example, when Sarah and I first got married, uh, about a year into our marriage, we bought our first house. Um, and uh, any, any newlywed people in the house? Let me see your hands, like within a few years. Okay, there you go. There you go. Um, so we bought our first house, and when we rolled into this house, um, we, we, the, the yard was uh, just clovers. And I was like, not today, son. 
not today, because your boy's got a black thumb. <laughs> it's not good. Um, but I was like, you know what? I can do this. I can figure out a way. I'm going to grow grass. I'm going to kill all the clovers. I'm going to kill all the dandelions. And uh, Which, by the way, dandelions, Sarah told me, they're good for your heart, so you should go pick them and eat them, apparently. Um, it's a real thing. You can cook them and everything. Google it later. Anyway, um, so we roll into this house, and I, I'm thinking, I'm going to make this place look awesome. We're going we're gonna to make this grass look great. And, and you know what I wanted? I wanted to get rid of all of the weeds, and I only wanted Bermuda grass. Anybody else like Bermuda? Oh, okay, no? All right, fescue people out here. All right, we're talking grass at church. So I wanted Bermuda, and, uh, and so I went to the store uh, after I Googled, and I didn't do a deep dive Google. I did the Google where I Googled, and then the first thing that popped up, it's, it was like a section out of one article. Y'all, need, y'all see these? And it popped up, and it said, get 2,4-D. I was like, all right, I'll go get 2,4-D. So I went to Ace, I got some 2,4-D, and it's the stuff that's supposed to kill uh, all the weeds and leave the grass. And I thought, hey, what's better than that? And so I went and I got some 2,4-D. And I took it, I put it in a spray rig, and I bathed the grass, baby. I bathed everything. I was just whopping it all over the place and boop, 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 and putting it all over the place. And then I went and got some Bermuda seed. I threw the Bermuda seed out. And I overseeded it, man. I just threw it and threw it and threw it. I didn't, like, prepare the ground or anything. I just threw it on top of the hard ground. Like, there, it was, was not going anywhere. Threw it on top of there. And, uh, yeah. And then I got some fertilizer, and I threw it on top of there. Fertilizer, and I threw it on top of there. I was like, fertilizer, baby. All this next sprout up. It's going to be amazing next week. The next week, uh, it was, there were no seeds. The fertilizer, uh, the, the fertilizer had done nothing, and my whole grass was Dead. It was like a barren wasteland. It was like a barren wasteland. And like, wasteland. All, of it, like, and like all of it, like we had a dirt patch right near our sidewalk, our sidewalk that was just like dirt. dirt for, and it was like dirt for like a year. It was and my really mom bad. actually told me she was like, and my mom actually told me she was like, Austin, you can't just leave your grass, your your front yard like this. Spray paint. You just go get some spray paint. I kid you. Go get some spray paint now. Go get some spray paint now. And go get some green spray paint and just spray paint the dirt. I was like, you have to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. I knew better than that, so I stopped right I knew better than that, so I stopped right there, and I didn't do that. We just sold the house. The yard's going to be terrible forever. The yard's going to be terrible forever. We just sold the house. And I tell you that to say, and I tell you that to say, too much of a good thing can be bad. Too much 2,4-D was bad. Too much fertilizer can be bad. Too much of a good thing can be bad. The same thing goes with calling the champion out of people. There's three quick ways I want to show you how to call the champion out of people, and it's a balance of all three. But if you go too much in one direction, you can turn a good thing into a bad thing. How to call the champion out of How to call the champion out of people. people. Number one, number one, if you're writing this down, number one is encouraging people. Call the champion out of Call the champion out of them. Bye. Man, I believe with all of my heart that you can go almost anywhere else in the world to hear what you're not. I want this place to be a place where anybody and everybody can come in and they can hear not what they're not, not even what they are, but what God can do and God wants to do in their life. That God has a plan for you. That God has a purpose for you. That, that God wants to form you into something that he can use. That's what I want every single person to know when they come into this space. Many people, like, you may not even be surprised by this, but many people never get told by a parent, by, by an employer, by a teacher, what they can be. So many people live their whole life, and all they're ever told is you won't do that, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, and all they're ever told are negative after negative after negative until eventually they start to believe it. That might be your story, that you, are, you, are, you grew up in a household, you grew up with parents, you grew up in some kind of system where you were never told what you could be, much less what God could do through you. And you've just been told negative after negative after negative that you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you're not athletic enough, you're not pretty enough. You wake up and you look in the mirror and you're not what you wanted to see. You look in the mirror and all you see is something that you wish would change. I think the church should be a place where you should come and you should be able to sit down in this place and somebody ought to be able to come and tell you and encourage you and lift you up and let you know, you know what, you are a child of God. 
You're, you've been redeemed. You have righteousness that is not your own. You, you are a royal priesthood that God wants to work in and through your life in ways that you cannot think, ask, or imagine. That's encouraging people, encouraging people and like getting down on a really practical level. Some of your parents, they didn't encourage you and you, you felt negative after negative after negative, not because they didn't think encouraging things, but because they never said them. Did you know that you can think really encouraging things about your spouse? <laughs> you can think really encouraging things about your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You can think very encouraging things about those that you lead or those that you follow. And if you never verbalize an encouragement, it never becomes an encouragement. A verbal encouragement is the only kind there exists. And what I found in marriage, guys, I don't know about y'all, but what I found in marriage is that Sarah still cannot read my mind. And I wish she could because it would make our marriage so much better. Any guys in the house? Amen. All right, come on. Because, <clears throat> like, I'm just looking at her like, uh, it's, my pants are over there, you know. <laughs> Your phone's over there, you know. But you've got to communicate, communicate. It's why one of the things that I put into a rhythm of my life, not just because I'm a pastor of the church, but a rhythm of my life is to start celebrating other people. It's to start encouraging other people. I am not a natural encourager. Thank you. <laughs> I, need to, I need to encourage you, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, running, our, running the sound for our live stream. Come on, somebody. Yeah. If they're commenting right now, like, can't hear him, can't hear you know, you suck, bro. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's coming up next. <laughs> Encourage, encourage. You rise and you fall to your level of encouragement or expectation. If you've ever had kids, your kids will rise or fall to the level of your expectation of them. That is a proven psychological fact. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. I try and take a step back to celebrate other people intentionally because it's not something I do naturally. To take a step back, and on Sunday, I do something called Celebrate Sunday, and I put it on my Instagram stories, and I, I just celebrate a few people, not because I know everything or because I'm doing everything right, but because I know that people need some encouragement in their life. You know what I think would be amazing, what I think would be really cool, is that everyone that calls Heart and Soul home is that all of us started to do something called Celebrate Sunday, where we would just sit back and you say, you know what, I, maybe it's not about church, maybe it's about something else, somebody in my, a co-worker or this or that. I think that heart and soul should be synonymous with calling the champion out of people. That when people think about heart and soul church, you know what they think about? They think about an army full of encouraging people. Not people that are naturally encouraging, because your boy is not one of them, but people that intentionally encourage. You know what, I would rather have somebody intentionally encourage me than naturally just because that, they're a nice person. To be intentional, intentional, intentional. We encourage other people. Get on your Instagram stories tonight. Tag Heart and Soul Church and tag somebody and celebrate what God is doing through their life. Celebrate Sunday. See, encouragement is kind of like water. I got some sod here. I got some sod. This is real grass. I'm going to put this in my backyard today too. It's going to look good. have one good little piece. <laughs> Stuff is expensive, though, all right? That's all I can afford, this. Um, <laughs> it's falling apart. I don't know. Um, so this is sod. Devin, you know about sod. Um, encouragement, get this, encouragement is like water. Encouragement is like water. Everybody needs some encouragement. Grass needs water. Amen. That's good preaching. <laughs> Grass needs water. Grass needs water, but guess what? Too much grass, too, or too much water, too much water, and you might drown the grass. And don't fact check me on that, because I don't really know. But too much water, too much of a good thing may not be a good thing. If all we ever do in calling the champion out of people is encourage them and lift them up and tell them they're great and you're going to be the best and God can use you, and yeah, 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 we're missing a whole entire section of calling the champion out of people. Because calling the champion out of people is not just encouraging them. Number two, calling the champion out of them is challenging them. Challenging them. 
<laughs> challenging them. It's challenging people to, to, to remove some of the bad habits in their life, some of the sinful things that are holding them back. To run the race and to throw off every sin, every hindrance in their life. Encouragement and, and calling the champion out of people is not just all rainbows and butterflies. Sometimes it's sitting down with somebody and saying, hey, guess what? You know what? Noah, baby, you can be better. You can do better. And it's not, it's not you doing better. It's God working through you. Challenging them and saying, you know what? You missed the mark here today, but guess what? I believe that God can use you, and God wants to use you, and God has big plans for you, and I'm not just going to sit by and let you just flounder in this rut that you're in. I'm going to challenge you to be better and do better for His glory. That's why you desperately need to be in a party or on a team, preferably both. Because, again, like I said before, we got enough people out there that are serving. We don't need anything from you. We want something for you. That if you, if you join a team, you will be encouraged, but you will also be challenged. If you join a party, you won't just be encouraged. You will also be challenged because we believe that God has something bigger planned for your life than you can do on your own. Sometimes the most encouraging thing you can do is to challenge somebody. If you're a parent, you know that. <laughs> Discipline is not something that you always love to do. And I'm not saying you come in and discipline somebody. I'm saying challenge, challenge has to work in the context of relationship. You can't be just rolling around challenging people and saying, hey, that was not good, that was not good. You should be better, you can do better. No, 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 it's a trust. You deposit trust and then you can then re request and take out challenge. So many of us, we... We don't know about challenging people because we feel awkward. It has to be in the context of trust, in the context of relationship. It's another reason why, like 2,4-D, for example, 2,4-D, too much of that is not good. But just enough is good to kill the weeds. You know what challenging people is? Challenging people is helping them to remove the weeds in their life. The things that are holding them back, the things that are, that, are, that are not going to move them forward for the glory of God, the things that, that are bad habits in their life, it's helping them remove it. But too much of that can turn bad. Just the right amount can help them in following Jesus. I love my church because we call the champion out of people. The last one, quickly, is calling the champion. How to call the champion out of people. Calling the champion out of people is simply adding value to their life. Encouraging them is verbalizing and, and celebrating and doing all this stuff and challenging them and saying, hey, you can, you can do better. You know what adding value is? Adding value has nothing to do with anything that they can do. Adding value is a question. Adding value is simply, is their life better because of you? Adding value to somebody else's life. My dad said my whole life, what you make happen for other people, God will make happen for you. It's the law of the harvest. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. How much value are you adding to other people's lives? How much fertilizer are you adding to people's lives? How, how much, like if you were to be removed from someone's life, would they even know you were gone? Would their life get better? Would their life get worse? Would their life stay the same? And you can't do this for everybody, but we should all do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Add value to one person. Add value to one person. Add value to one leader. Add value to one employee. Add value to one student. Add value to one kid. Add value to one thing. Add value to somebody else is calling the champion out of them. Which leads me to Jesus. Because when we look in the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus is full of moments where he was encouraging people. The life of Jesus is filled with moments where he's challenging people, where he tells, he, he encourages the woman who's caught in adultery and says, you know what, I don't condemn you either. And then he challenges her and says, now go and leave your life of sin. 
Jesus is always adding value to people's lives. When, when he feeds the 5,000, he is adding value. It's not anything that they could do on their own. He is adding value to their life. Jesus is constantly calling the champion out of people. And if it is our job as believers, if it is our job at heart and soul to be like Jesus, we should be a community of people that are known for calling the champion out of people. Jesus, Jesus, here's how he did it. He told them, he told them, his disciples and people that followed him, he told them that they could do what they couldn't do. (laughs) He told them that they could do what they couldn't do. Jesus rolls up in a storm, walking on water. Y'all remember this story? And he calls to Peter. He says, Peter, come out on the water. Peter, I don't know if you know this or not, but Peter is not the water walking type. Like he doesn't do this on the weekends. He doesn't do this with his friends and family. Like, he doesn't come from a water-walking family. Peter has never walked on water before, but Jesus told him that he could do something that he couldn't do on his own. Did you know that calling the champion out of somebody is you telling them that they can do something because of Jesus that they couldn't do without him? Jesus told them that they could be what they couldn't be without him. Peter, again, this dude. Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter ran back to fishing because that's what he knew. He left leadership. He left being a disciple as Jesus died and laid in the tomb. And then Jesus comes back to Peter. (laughs) And Jesus tells Peter, 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 do you love me? Will you feed my sheep? Peter, do you love me? Will you feed my sheep? And he's telling Peter, Peter, I need you to be what you don't think you can be. I need you to be a leader because Jesus always calls us to things that we cannot do on our own. Calling the champion out of Peter. He told them, get this, this is for somebody in the house today. He told them that they were more than just their past. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, met, and his life is eternally changed. But before that, Paul, <laughs> Paul was killing Christians. And then Paul's life is turned around, not because of himself, but because of what Jesus did in his life. Jesus called the champion out of him, changed his life, encouraged, challenged, added value to him, and then Paul became the one that wrote most of the New Testament epistles. Paul became the, one of the greatest evangelists to ever live, and Paul was used by God because God didn't give up on him. And we don't give up on people because of their past. That's not the end. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus did the same thing that he did for Peter and for Paul and all throughout the New Testament. Jesus does the same thing to you and to me today. He's calling us to do things that we couldn't do by ourselves. He's calling us to be stuff that we couldn't be by ourselves. He's calling us to lead in ways that we couldn't lead by ourselves. He's calling us to move past our past and to move into the future that he has for us, not in and of ourselves, but through his power. That's what Jesus did then, and that's what Jesus is doing now. See, calling the champion out of people is simply helping people see in themselves something that they couldn't see without you. Peter could not have seen that he could have been the leader without Jesus. Peter, Peter did not know, did not know that he could come back to the Lord without Jesus. Paul did not know he could be used by God without Jesus. Who in your life is doing something for the Lord, is following Jesus, and they wouldn't be doing that without you in their life? Without you adding value and encouraging and challenging and calling the champion out of them. That's what happens when, when I encourage somebody, when you encourage somebody, when you challenge somebody to be more of what God created them to be, when you add value to their life, we start to see something in them, in them that would never have been there without God using us. A couple weeks ago, as I wrap up here, a couple weeks ago, um, I was just like very frustrated 
very frustrated, very disappointed. God has been working, doing amazing things. We've seen in six months over 100 people say yes to Jesus. Come on, you can clap for that. We've seen 30 people get baptized. We, uh, like Maddie and, Maddie and Josh said, because of your generosity, we give away a percentage of everything that comes in here. And because of your generosity, we've been able to give away through outreach and events over $20,000 in six months as a brand new church. Yeah. And I say all that to say that God is just moving. God is doing amazing things here. He's doing amazing things here. But your boy sometimes can get disappointed and can get frustrated by some of the, some of the more worldly side of things where I wish this whole, this whole building was full right now. And if I'm not careful, I'll leave here and I'll see somebody come to know Jesus and I'll leave here disappointed because there were some seats that were empty. When I have to back up and say, man, but God is doing something special. God is doing something special here. That we started a church in a a pandemic. That that God has, has moved every single week. That we are just over six months old and then we are double and triple the size of most church plants at this time. God has done amazing things. And I have to step back intentionally to see that. And a couple weeks ago, I didn't step back and I was just really all up in my feels. I felt like Drake and I was very disappointed. And so what I did is I said, man, if I'm disappointed, there has to be somebody else that's disappointed. There's got to be some other people that are frustrated. So I just started, I'm a voice memo guy on iPhone. And so I just started voice memoing people and encouraging them and challenging them and trying to add value to them. And I kid you not, the more I encouraged other people, the more I challenged other people, The more I added value to somebody else's life, the more I called the champion out of people, the more I myself was encouraged. The more that I myself was challenged, the more that I was seeing value added back to me, not because there were nice things returned for my nice words, no, 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 but because Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And God, through His Holy Spirit, was refreshing my mind and renewing my mind and encouraging me and saying, you're not done. It's not over. God's using you. God's got big plans. Because when you will sit back and you will call the champion out of somebody else, God will return the favor. And you know what? The the greatest thing that God has ever done? (laughs) The greatest thing that God has ever done in my life, the greatest thing that God has ever done, if you know Jesus in your life, is he let his son come to earth to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. Man. And if he never does anything else for me, that that right there calls more of a champion out of me because without him, I would be dead in my sins. Without him, I would only be my past. Without him coming and giving me a fresh start, I would only know my name as my sins. I would only recognize myself and label myself based on my shame, based on my guilt, based on my regret, based on the things other people have done to me or I have done to other people. But because of Jesus, (laughs) because of Jesus, I have a fresh start. Because of Jesus, I am no longer what someone says about me. I am what he calls me. And he calls me a son. He calls me a new creation. He calls me redeemed. And today, today, before you ever get encouraged, (laughs) before you ever get challenged, before you ever get some value added to your life, and I hope all three of those things happen at heart and soul in the context of a party, of a team, But before you ever get into that, I hope that you get the greatest champion called out of you by coming to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed.